first reading. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and all who loved, who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is a beautiful Psalm 23. We read responsibly, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff may comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The epistle for today is from 1 John 3, 16 to 24. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for brothers. But if anyone has his world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth, and we share our heart before him. For whatever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments and abides in Him, and He in them, and by this we know that He abides in us, by the Spirit whom He has given us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And I invite you, together with all believers in the worldwide Holy Christian and Apostolic Church, to confess our faith today in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Almighty. maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Peace. Oh. 
grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many rich metaphors and pictures that you display in the pages of Holy Scripture to us regarding yourself. As we put them all together, it gives us a most blessed tapestry, most blessed portrait of you. You are a, you are a multifaceted, rich treasure to us, your people. We pray, pray that you would speak to our hearts today deeply and show us the great love that you have for us as our good shepherd. Help us to take in that love. Help us to be transformed by that love as individuals and as your church, as this Christian community right here in this place. Help us find ways, Lord, through the Holy Spirit to bring that rich love wherever we go. Amen. The last few weeks, last three weeks, we've been talking about power that our Lord Jesus Christ has. He has the power to lay down his own life and to take it back up again. We've seen him for three weeks displaying his resurrection power to his disciples and, and to the church. Today we want to take a little bit different of a picture of Jesus Christ, take him in um, at just a different angle and see him as our good shepherd. So we want to talk today about the good shepherd and his flock. And Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. I'm not the good CEO. I'm not the, the good chief executive officer or president of the corporation. I am the good shepherd. So let's hold out on to that thought. We do live in a capitalistic country. We're surrounded by many prosperous businesses and enterprises, which I think is a good thing, but it's not carried too far. And so in order for them to grow, they usually find a very gifted person, a president, a CEO, an executive of some sort, and it's his job description to make the company grow, to inspire the leadership, to keep on top of or make sure that the co company keeps on top of the latest trends, um, that they are on the cutting edge, the cutting cusp of research and development so that they can grow and that they can bring in as much capital as possible. Um, but that means that the CEOs and the executives, they might deal with the upper echelon management, but when it trickles down to lower management and then the regular employees, they don't have much contact. And that's the way it should be in the corporate world. So if there's a branch out there somewhere, or a warehouse somewhere, or a factory somewhere that's dragging the business down. There might be hundreds, thousands of workers down in Atlanta, Georgia, or San Francisco, or Portland, Oregon. But that particular aspect of the business is not profitable. And so what the CEO has to do and the board needs to do is probably, corporately speaking, eliminate that branch. That means hundreds, maybe thousands of people are either displaced or they lose their jobs. But that's the focus of corporate America, the corporate executive. He's got to think about the bottom line for the country or for the company and not for the little peons down there. Jesus said though, and he used this metaphor, uh, this rich metaphor, um, in a way that was very intentional. 
I am the good shepherd. I'm not the good CEO. I'm not the good corporate board member. I am the good shepherd. Corporate board members and the presidents and whatnot, they wear usually nice expensive suits and clothes and the corporate executive is in the boardroom and he's ruthless in the boardroom sometimes. He's got to make snap decisions and he's got to keep people in line. Um, shepherd, at least the Middle Eastern first century AD shepherd on the other hand, you wouldn't see him walking around in the fields with a nice $500 suit on. You'd see him out there with his beasts, putting himself sometimes right in the trajectory of danger in order to save one of the sheep. Sheep. You'd see him getting his fingernails dirty, trying to take out a thorn or trying to find a worm or something that's bored its way into the skin of the sheep. So there's a totally different picture that we have oftentimes between leadership in our world today and our leader of our movement, the greatest worldwide movement known in history, and that is the Holy Catholic or Holy Christian Church. Corporate officials don't have that much of a relationship with people down the line, but Jesus Christ, our great leader, the great shepherd and bishop of our souls, cares about everyone, all the way up to the top and trickling down to the most insignificant sheep that there is. He loves us all, and he has a relationship with us. And I want to talk about that relationship with us. Um, he's not up in a celestial boardroom making decisions that are detached from you and me today. But he is the great I am who came down and lived among us and he was pummeled and he was put down for our sakes in order to care for us. I want to refresh your memory as to what the gospel lesson says again. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. There was a woman, actually a young lady, a student at a nursing school somewhere in the United States. She was a very brilliant young lady. She studied hard, and this particular day, in the classroom where she was at, the teacher decided to throw a pop exam on them. And since she studied so hard and since she was so brilliant, she just whizzed through the test while everybody else was sweating and struggling. Then she came to the last question and it threw her for a loop. She couldn't understand it. She didn't know where it was coming from. The question was, you now she's looking at all these chemistry, uh, equations and everything, and she's got them down. The last question is, who is the lady that cleans this classroom? And she left it blank. She turned it in. After everybody else in the classroom turned their papers in, uh, someone raised their hands. And they, this person said, is that last question going to count against us on this exam? teacher said, you bet it will, because you are in a profession where you're going to be called on to serve people and love people, and you need to know their names and you need to respect them. And she said that was one of the most valuable lessons she ever learned as a nurse, to know people's names. And so after that, she went out and she found out the name of the lady who cleaned their classroom. Jesus goes even farther than that. He not only knows your name, he knows your heart, he knows the weaknesses that you have, the strengths that you have, he knows what you're going through right now. 
and he loves you, and he intentionally laid down his life for you. As your good shepherd, he went all the way to the cross, and he died on the cross and rose again so that you could have a relationship with him, so that he could be your good shepherd and the bishop of your souls, so that he could hear your prayers, comfort you when you need comfort, and cheer you on when you're going down the right path. And this message about our good shepherd and his selfless love for us is a message that inevitably will get a response. I want to ask you something right now. How many times do you think you've heard the gospel in your life? Maybe a million times? So maybe today it's going to be the million and one time uh, you've heard the gospel before. And sometimes when we hear something over and over and over again, it just goes through one ear and out the other. But I would also say to you that the gospel is such a powerful, less, uh, a, a powerful message that somewhere in there, even though we've heard it a million times, our soul delights in hearing it again. It's refreshing. It's faith strengthening. It gets us back on the right track. But I say to you again today that the gospel does demand a response. And as we look around, some of the responses are indifference. That is a response. So if you're indifferent to the gospel, you say, ho-hum, I guess that would be a response of sorts. Sometimes the response is anger. Um, sometimes the response is surprising. You might encounter someone who is hardened, who is a criminal, who is the last person in the world that you think would be a religious type who hears the gospel, and there is a positive response. I was at the Gideon's Pastor's Banquet a couple weeks ago with Crystal out at Heidi's. Um, they had pretty good food there, by the way. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the beef was a little rare, but other than that, it was good. Um, anyway, um, I think I've heard this, this uh, story before, but it bears repeating. Uh, maybe you've heard me talk about it before, I don't know. But anyway, there is a man. His name is Jacob Koshi. He lived in Singapore. And his goal, from the time he was probably in high school or younger, was to be very, very rich. And he believed early on that the only way that he could become very, very rich, where he was at, was through crime. So he went into the dark underbelly of the society and culture of his day. He got into the gambling world. He got into the drug trafficking world. And he was very, very successful. He became the leader of an international drug smuggling ring. And he was living the high life, and he thought everything was going this way until he was arrested. He was put into a drug rehabilitation prison. And he was the angriest man in the whole wide world because things were now not going his way. And he lost everything that he had uh, used his intelligence and his abilities to build up. And they wouldn't even allow him to smoke in his cell. But he found a way around that. He had connections outside. So he had tobacco smuggled into the prison. And here's where the Gideons come in. I think you kind of know where I'm going now. Um, he had a Gideon Bible. And so it tear page by page out. And he'd use the Gideon Bible pages as cigarette paper. He'd put this, the tobacco in, roll it up, and have his cigarettes. Well, one day, he was smoking away, and he fell asleep. And when he woke up, all the tobacco was burned out, but the cigarette paper was still there. 
He thought that was kind of curious. So he peeled it open and unrolled it, and there was a verse there that had not been seared by the flame or the smoke. It was very clear. And the verse was, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And for some reason, that word just rang in his mind. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he couldn't get it out of his mind. And so he asked for another Gideon Bible, but this time he wasn't going to smoke it. He was going to read it. And he read through the book of Acts, and he came upon this first, the story of this first century criminal by the name of Saul, who killed people just because they were of a different religion than he was, and murdered people and sent them to prison and disrupted their lives horribly. And after he read through that, he came to the distinct impression in his mind and his heart that if God can change a criminal like that man, he can change me. He got down on the floor in his cell. He called out to the good shepherd of his soul, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he repented of his sins and he said, be my Lord and Savior. And the minute he did that, he says that he started crying. He couldn't stop crying. The tears just rolled down. And then finally, after he stopped crying, he felt like a new person. The old had gone away, the new had come, and the only way he can describe it is that these tears came from the Lord, and they simply washed away his former life as he repented in the power of the Holy Spirit and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in jail, a part of his response to the Good Shepherd was that he started talking about his experience with his fellow inmates. And then soon he was released... He became the member of a church, he married, and now he's a missionary in the Far East, telling people all over the place about what Christ Jesus did to his life. And it all happened when he started out smoking the Bible of all things. So, the message of our Good Shepherd is a powerful message. The message of the gospel is a powerful gospel. And when it's preached in its truth and purity, it does miraculous things. It even rehabilitates and converts the hardest of criminals. And uh, the gospel, like I said, it stirs up responses in people's hearts. We see some of the response today in the Middle East it's a response of unbelief and anger. And so many of our brothers and sisters throughout the Middle East today are having their heads cut off. They're having to flee to other parts of the world, to here to the United States and other parts of the world, to get away from the fierce, angry reaction of the world over there. But the fact of the matter is, there still is always a positive reaction to the gospel. And Jesus says again, I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. So when we stop resisting the Good Shepherd and start embracing Him through the power of the Spirit and through the Word and begin a relationship with Him, he knows us, and we begin to know him. And it's kind of an interesting uh, interaction here. He knows us as he knows the Father. The Father and the Son have had an eternal relationship with one another since before the creation of the universe. And uh, it's a blessed interaction and relationship. And he says, when you become a sheep in my fold, I know you like that. But he also says that we know him as he knows the Father. And sometimes when we read the Bible, sometimes when we're living our lives out there in the world, the devil makes us think, and our flesh makes us think that, oh man, this 
Christianity with all these rules and restrictions that we have to follow. It's like he's trying to hem us in and take all the fun away from us. But then when we know him as our good shepherd, we come into a totally different understanding of the law and the word of God. The, the good shepherd doesn't give us his laws. He doesn't show us in his scriptures what's right and wrong because he wants to hem us in. It's because he's concerned about us. He's concerned about the dangers. He's concerned about the, the devil who is lurking around there trying to destroy us. And when we understand that, then we gladly follow him. Because we know that he's there not to take away our fun, but to show us the right way and to protect us. And there's another response that I think happens probably almost spontaneously um, in the sheep of the Good Shepherd. Um, we know him. He lives inside of us. And so there should be, and there is, a desire in us to live like he did. Let me read this to you. This is also John, but it's the epistle of John. It was the epistle lesson for today. And listen carefully. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So, that's another thing that genuine Christianity, if the good shepherd is really living inside of us, uh, we see happening in our lives. And I want to say that he says that he laid down our life, his life for us. I'd like you to picture this. Here's the sheep pen here. This blessed fellowship of all the saints. Jesus Christ, the chief bishop and shepherd of our souls. But here's a big gaping uh, chasm, kind of like the Grand Canyon. And here we are, way over here. There's no way that we can jump across that chasm by ourselves and get into the sheepfold. It's impossible. We might almost get there, but we're going to fall down the crack and we're going to get destroyed. But it says that he laid down his life for the sheep. And that's an a, a image that comes from the life of a shepherd. He would oftentimes lay in the uh, opening to the sheepfold to protect the sheep. Well, Jesus laid down his life. He laid his life down over that great chasm. So we simply pass through and over Jesus. And because of his life and death and resurrection, we get to go into the sheep pen and we get to be with the Lord. And once we come into that blessed fellowship with him, we live as he lived. And one of the ramifications, one of the responses of being a Christian is, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you might say something or do something that offends me and angers me, but I forgive you because my Lord and Savior has forgiven me. We might not see eye to eye on everything. But because my Lord loved me and we've got such a mission out there to reach other lost sheep that we'll do anything that we can to, under the Lordship of Christ, cooperate with one another. And if I see you in need, maybe there's an emotional need that you have. Maybe there's a physical need that you have. Maybe you don't have any food in your house this month for whatever reason. Because my good shepherd loved me and provides for all of my needs. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to make sure that I empty out my pantry so that you can have something to eat. That's my responsibility as a member of the body of Christ. And I take it seriously. And I believe that you do towards me also. 
we've been talking a lot the last couple of years at Faithful Savior Lutheran Church about reconnecting with our community. Because churches all over the United States seem to be detached many times from the community around them. So we're these little oases of Christianity in a sea of secularism. And we want to know people to know who we are and that we have so much to offer in Jesus Christ. And so some of us have been trying intentionally to go out to participate in the can drive, to participate in some of the neighborhood functions. But if we're doing all of these things, but we don't have the basics in order, it's never going to work. And that is that we have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. And as his sheep, we're following where he tells us to go. Even though it might be difficult to us personally, we're loving one another in a radical way and embracing one another. And when we get that down, I believe it will be very, very simple as we go out. They will see the uniqueness of the body of Christ. And we won't even have to twist arms. They will be attracted to the living Good Shepherd who is inside of us, who loves us and loves them. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.